So this is the first time we are doing a video review with for all, all of us, where we are reviewing books from our interdisciplinary um, backgrounds. Uh, this uh, year, we decided to finish it off with a book from my field uh, called Angrynomics by Mike Blythe and, and Eric Longin. And so uh, the, this project came uh, into the existence because we wanted to make sure that we can cover all different you know, backgrounds in terms of the discipline in reviewing one single book. So this is kind of unique and creation that we have decided to go on. It has, you know, very interesting title that is great for ending this year, Angrynomics, right? This is something that every one of us might feel. Uh, 2020 has been hard for everyone, but I think it's an in interesting take on what has happened in the past few years. And it allows us to, you know, even with the background um, of economics, that my colleague feared, I think it's written in such a um, easy way to understand, very accessible. So we'll, we'll be happy to discuss the book and share our own perspectives on it. So before we begin the review, I wanted to um, get you through the introductions of to all of us and uh, to tell you where we're coming from and to help you understand our perceptions of the book. So let's start with Greg, who is the first one to Tell us about his field. Uh, I'm Greg. I'm, my field is international relations and global governance. So not IPE, not economics at all. Right. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm Kate Petrich. I work on international security. And the closest that I get to economics is I work on illicit economies quite a bit. So um, the formal models don't usually match up. So this was an interesting read for me. Perfect. Danina? I'm Janina Pasinski, and I work on migration and citizenship, and I do not touch economics. So this was an interesting read for me. Perfect. And as I said, I'm Anastasia. This is right up my alley. I'm a political economist. So everything was very accessible to me, given that I've been trained in that, but also very interesting because it provided new perspectives, new looks on the issue. So to kick off this discussion, really, let's start with the format of the book. What do you think about the way how it was written? The approach is really a dialogue between Mark and Eric trying to explain all of the individual cases, their perception about what is going on with the current system. And it's interestingly that it draws also on interdisciplinary scholarship. So kind of like we are doing right now, we are rebranding the book. So basically doing the di dialogue, re deconstructing it, bringing our own perspectives. So what do you guys think about the format? Did you like it? Did you learn a lot? Do you like the delivery of it? Uh, this was a book version of a podcast for me. It felt very much like these guys wanted to start a podcast and they wrote a book instead, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I thought it probably was very accessible for undergraduates, um, this kind of more conversational style. Um, I do have to cop to, uh, there's a part early in the book where they say something like our academic colleagues are going to have a hard time with the fact that there's no citations in this. And I did, I had a hard time with that. I think for me, it, as soon as I said that, I said, okay, this is not an academic book. But even though I knew that as I was reading it, I kept wanting it to be. So I was sort of applying academic reading to a book that was not designed for that. And I think that while that does make it really accessible to a generalist audience, um, it was not necessarily satisfying in terms of looking at where the research is coming from and what they're founding their claims on. And I didn't actually find that the dialogue aspect of it added anything to the book because to me, it wasn't clear who each of these people and what their perspectives were. So Really, the fact that it was just divided into two voices didn't make much of a difference for me. I think it could have been written without the dialogue style and still kept that easy conversational tone. The dialogue style didn't bother me that much. I mean, it reminded me a bit of the, the kind of million dialogue where you're trying to prove a point. My issue was how they set up each dialogue with a straw, uh, a yeah. straw man argument, and yeah. the straw man argument was flawed. I mean, it's meant to be flawed, but it was flawed factually and I know what Kate means where was the footnotes but more than that <laughs> not even the other side of the argument the the basis for the straw man argument of the preceding and following dialogue was not based upon embracing all of the facts and the situation so it, it was for me it was an interesting way of doing it but it was limited in actually what knowledge it provides for me it would be a worry assigning this to any of my undergrads for 
teaching purposes because it gives a really good snapshot, I think, of some of the economic and political thinking of sections of the left and sections of the right, but it doesn't actually give a nuanced view. It gives a, an almost a propagandist view of what the problem is without actually actually backing up that problem. So I think the common ground is we need it to be either bigger and cover all of the issues and get us the citations that we needed. And maybe that would have made the book better and the dialogue, we could keep it, we could leave it. But I think what we are missing here is the background that could go deeper into specific issues. Do I capture it right? Do we have any? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would also, I mean, as a qualitative scholar, I, I like having their little, their little vignettes at yes. the beginning yeah. of each chapter. I think that that can be very powerful, but, um, it didn't appear to me that these guys were qualitative scholars in the way that they presented that evidence. And so I think there was a real opportunity here that I, I would love to see in other books, you know, of having this kind of notes from the field piece to sort of illustrate the bigger themes. Um, it, they just missed it a little bit for me in terms of the execution, but I applaud the effort. Yeah, actually, I really enjoyed the second half of the book in terms of their ideas around economic change. Now, I don't buy into all of them and we can talk about it later but for me it was very much a book of two halves i see what they were trying to do but the first half mm. just was not substantiated both at academic level or non-academic level which meant that that undermined the second half for me in terms of its argument which was a shame because i think some of the things they were talking about and the points they were making were really important and really interesting but if it had focused on that rather than the first half it would have been a better kind of synopsis for me Absolutely. Those are great perspectives. So let's get to the title, because the title is fascinating. You know, end of the book, we get a punch with angrynomics. Like, you know, it, it couldn't get any more interesting, right? We see a lot of anger, right? As the book has described, there's yellow jackets, there's all the protests around the world, but they also connected with the failure of the system, the capitalist, you know, version point three crashing, right? So they said that angrynomics is a system of high uncertainty and anger combined together. So how would you think how reflective is it of the author's main argument like the title the presentation like this this little fist punch that they have put together it's, it's quite interesting to see the you know the connections between the anger the economics and all of the little components so what is your take on it guys i didn't really see the added value of calling it angrynomics to me what they described as angrynomics i read it and i was like well isn't that just populism I mean, I love a good title. I am, I am a sucker for a good title. And I thought that this was a good, a good branding, right? Of that it tells you very quickly what it is. And again, if you're searching for a generalist audience, right? This makes it a little more accessible. It makes it a little clearer about what they're doing. Um, I think we're gonna get into this a little bit later. I had some issues with how they distinguish between their sort of two types of anger and all of these other things. Um, but from a complete like title level, I thought it was great, you know, <laughs> like. Punchy, yeah, definitely punchy, punchline, right? I mean, it, it will, it's catchy and it will sell books. And it, and it, it harks after that passion or that um, big name kind of engagement that exists a lot on the, on the segments of the left at the moment about, you know, we've got to rail against this, this is a problem, if we only understood this more. I think the issue is, and, and Kate's going to jump on me because she's the qualitative expert here. <laughs> and not to be academic about methodology, but they flag up right at the beginning, right? This isn't for academics, but we base our analysis of what anger is and our classification upon big data analysis of media headlines that involve the word anger and that, okay, but that's quite a limited sample and a limited way of doing it. And they then, for me, it's the irony that halfway through the book, they then flip over and criticize the media headlines about AI taking over the world yet they don't apply that same logic to their own angry argument. And for me, it's a contradiction in terms. Again, two half, two books in one. So don't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I think, but I do think that, that we have to acknowledge that there does feel like there's a lot of anger, right, in the global Absolutely. conversation right now, both domestically and internationally. And, and so I think it is fair. I, I agree with you on the measurement issue, right? Um, and trying to capture something like emotion is so difficult to do on a macro level. Like it's just, mm -hmm. we have imperfect measures. And so, so yes, I think, I think there's a lot of energy right now, both inside and outside of academia of trying to explain where this anger is coming from, right? And this this feeling of 
uncertainty and rage and and populism, right? We've we've talked about that before, and and that they distinguish in in some ways between anger and populism. That I'm not overwhelmingly convinced by, but um, you know, it's. I think I think it was reasonable to call it angrynomics. Um, it is I think it. for me, it's one thing to use it as a catchy title, and that it certainly works for it. But I'm a bit more skeptical in sort of proposing it as a catch-all theory that explains all of the political and economic ills currently facing our society. Exactly. And building on that, they d distinguish four stressors that they see as you know causing those angrynomics. So we have you know change in production markets as one. Fourth in industrial revolution is the second one, aging population and the intergenerational inequality is the third one, and as the fourth immigration. So how do you feel about those four components meshing in and you know, creating that anger? Does it, does it capture it all? Are we missing something? Because you've been hinting that we're missing something and I feel like there's more to the story. So you guys, what are your takes? And you're experts from different fields. So love to hear your turn on the, on the take on it. I'm gonna go out on a limb here, which will prove that I'm not an economist. The debates they had over intergenerational inequality, inequality as an issue, and inflation, the relationship between inflation and wage growth, I thought were really important and probably were the underlying key elements that could have made a really interesting contribution to what is driving anger from an economic perspective. But I don't think they explored that enough. Um, oh. And I think that the way they tried to explore it was, that, like I said, on a bit on a soft foundations and like take one of your categories there on um, banking systems and stuff. Right up in the introduction, their first straw man argument is about Iceland and how Iceland bounced back because it was a supportive state based upon not bailing out banks when they collapsed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, except that they left out the fact that one of the reasons Iceland was able to bounce back was it had a $5 billion loan from the IMF and from other Nordic countries to bail it out. And the fact that, yeah, okay, it protected domestic Icelandic account savers, retail investors. Um, but those who were either in the UK, the Netherlands, or other parts of Europe who were encouraged to put their normal everyday savings into Icelandic banks got wiped out. They don't mention that. So when they yeah. say Iceland is a good example of how we should do it differently, okay. But... <laughs> It would be interesting to have Mark and Eric here to see what they what they add to it. Well, they're because, totally yeah. going to ruin me because I'm not an economist. I'm going to make yeah. it dry, but still. Absolutely, um, yeah, that's great. Kate? I, I don't want to pile on, so I'll pivot and then pile on. Um, <laughs> but my, so where I can, I, I, think, I think it's useful to identify these sort of macro level stressors. However, they are incredibly UK, US, Western Europe focused stressors. Yeah. So when you're talking about an aging population and immigration, you have left out all of the developing world, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and I think that, that their, their model potentially has legs elsewhere, right? This, yeah. this um, well, I have some, some issues with, with their division of anger, as I've said before, but, but some elements of their model, right? We could apply in places like Kenya or India or Brazil, but not if it is so focused on this sort of um, concern about the population dying off, right? That that is, is one of these huge drivers, you know? Um, and so, so I'm frustrated in that way that they didn't scope their conditions correctly, right? It, it would have been yeah. fair to say we're we're talking about this anger in this specific, more, right? Yeah. You know, like, and then that, that would be fine. But they they present it as a, as a global theory, and it's not, right? It is very very much a scoped bias theory towards the global north, right, and the developed yeah. world. So, so that's that's a challenge for me. Not going to. <laughs> I was just sort of piling on what Kate said to say not only is it focused on primarily the US and Europe, but it it doesn't acknowledge at all how much of those economies are based on exploitation in the global south. Like there is nary a mention. Yeah, it, it, that division of north and south, they just don't engage with, but also the nuance of north and south within the west. Mm, so when they're okay. talking about 
government bonds and negative interest rates. Uh, they're talking about Northern European countries and the United States yeah. and Canada. Yeah. They're not talking about Southern European states at all. So they talk about the UK or the US or Germany having negative bond rates. Italy most certainly does not, Spain does not, Greece does not, but they don't engage with that. So what is this? Just a another division, a bit like the Eurozone that they critique yeah. quite so much. Like, well, well, I thought that was so interesting because some of their vignettes are coming out of Italy and Spain, yep. and, and and they're so there. It's like it's on the radar, but it doesn't quite get there, right? So, so how do we talk about about the fact that you can't black box all of Europe? Hmm. Right? Like, um, you can't. Sorry, Anastasia, I'm going to go off pivot again, but you also okay. can't black box the anger bit. So. I buy into a lot of the anger argument, the populism, as, as Kate and Janine mentioned, and like the Brexit referendum, don't even get me started on that. But when they make examples like they say that the, um, the referendum in Italy on the constitutional reform a few years ago was an example of angry people, angry economics, and uh, no, I mean, yeah, there was a degree of populism in that and a degree of screw you vote thing. But actually, the nuance is, constitutional change in Italy was a serious issue for a huge amount of people. There were genuine fears over providing the executive in Italy with more power. Fears from fascism, fears from why are you changing this now? And it wasn't just based upon anger. The, the no vote on the constitutional reforms in Italy was not just based on that, but they present it as a fait accompli. That is just one of the examples. This was based upon anger. But, but it wasn't. I think we need a second book and I think oh, this is where, where we're coming from and this is exciting because I think that where we all felt and when I read the book I felt the same way as you guys because I was missing the narratives some of the narratives that would be critical to explaining that anger in different countries right how do we explain it to China how do we transport that model right it's a completely different system right we have varieties of capitals the capitals yes it's it's one big system but not all of the countries take China right it's a capitalism Yes, but also has its different characteristics. And I think it's hard to be able to have the same narrative, same logic and apply it to everywhere. So I think there should be nuances and that could be a second book for them to write and for us to read and maybe critique again. So, but uh, thinking about the crashes, we had three of them as they said, right? And they compared it to a faulty software, right? The system crashed, we need a new software as they have said, and we need those new elements to make it better. Or do we keep going as we are going and, you know, generating this angrynomics thingy. So how do you guys feel? And this is this is previewing a little bit, I think, when we start talking about solutions. But one of my, mm -hmm. my challenges is that I think that they have dramatically undervalued the incremental, unsexy work of change, right? Mm -hmm. And that they that when they say that we haven't changed capitalism, we haven't done things, that's not accurate, right? Because there there are really huge forces that have that are pushing a direction right and that that policymakers have been trying to kind of you know wiggle along and that there have been huge amounts of again really unsexy re-regulation of tax codes of beef prices kind of a thing that that do add up right over time but they're technical and they tend to happen in you know closed elements or um you know closed Senate hearings or what have you. And so it's not big, sexy, we have overthrown capitalism for communism kind of thing. Um, they don't make headlines either. So right. And, and so, so I, I would agree that the system has crashed, but again, not everywhere, not in all of the same way for all of the same people. Here's the nuance problem. Um, but I really, really push back against this idea that there has been no change, that we're just rebooting the same faulty software over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I agree. Like, th this is a particular bone I have, I think, with stuff that comes out from the segments of the left, in the UK at least. And this, what the book feels like is a little bit like that. It's a little bit like a synopsis of a lot of the economic and political thinking of the left in the UK at times, which is those that came before didn't do anything. They, the centrists had no ideological purity. They, they did not contribute anything. They were just yes people to capitalism. We need a revolution to change the system. I mean, what? No. <laughs> Read a history book. Like, that's just not true. 
Um, but then that's probably the centrist dad in me that's raging against the revolutionaries. But at the same time, have we really, have, has the system really crashed and burned, right? Let's look Keynesianism after the 45, right? Did the system really crash and burn or did it just get changed when things didn't go well? Revamped, revamped, really right? Yeah. After 2008 or did it just like get amended? And oh. we to be fair, the crashes have been devastating. I mean, they were at, certainly at the individual level, um, at for at the state level for many developing states, right? Um, and so, so I don't I don't want us to frame it as though like, well, it was all fine because like you know it's all fine mm -hmm. because it wasn't, right? I mean, it, <laughs> the economy has crashed every time that I have graduated from any sort of a degree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> This is why I have higher education because I just keep going back to school. Um, so, <laughs> the uncertainty of it, right? Yeah, right. Going well, back to school, something I constant. Have to this again. <laughs> I have to go back to law school or something horrible. So, yeah. so I completely um, emotionally resonate with this idea of that there is anger and there is uncertainty and that oh. the, the game is rigged in such a way that we need to do something about it. I just disagree that it's the reset is that there, there hasn't been a reset right mm. um so and there have been instances yeah, right I, we're seeing sorry Jenny, go. no i was just gonna say to add on to what kate and greg have said which i completely agree with i think in addition to missing sort of the small incremental changes by framing it as crashes and reboots they miss the continuities too mm. that have continued across the system and problems that keep repeating themselves are excluded from their narrative. Exactly, and that's what frustrates me is like, I, they talk about austerity being, and particularly like in the UK examples of being a really bad idea. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I Austerity for me from a, a background where I think you invest in a recession, austerity was a seriously bad idea. A lot of people got hurt yeah. by it. It was mm. devastating and it was actually the worst thing to do. It stamped down on the growth of the economy and, and bouncing back in the recession. But rather than talk about that and the nuance of what needs to be done and what has been done since then, like Kate was saying, their argument is, well, we can just print money because that solves everything. <laughs> I'm like, hang on a minute. There's a reason the German government is really reluctant to do that, and you just have to pick up a high school history book to understand why that's a problem. So it's not exactly, they, they go from A to Z without touching anywhere in between or discussing what the problems with that might be. Hmm. Hmm. You're the economist, so tell me yeah. I'm wrong. Tell us we're wrong. Tell us we're wrong, Anastasia. <laughs> that's, that's all the point. I think what the book does, it exposes different avenues and we're picking on them. And I think this is great because we are disaggregating individual factors that they've thrown into a pot. And I think it's important to go and follow the narratives. So it is kind of, you know, it reminds me of this kind of mini guideline, mini map that you have to go and fill in with your own little research. I think this is where the book is great. And then right now we're digging and kind of you know, juxtaposing where we could add, what we could change. And this is especially interesting with their key propositions to make or resolve the problem that they have identified. And so for me, I think when I was reading those uh, things, some of them are already operational. Some of them, I don't know whether it was already in the system though when it crashed. So, you know, the, um, they are proposing creation of the National Wealth Fund. They're proposing, you know, as you have Greg kind of mentioned, the change of the banking systems operation, right? The more... Um, printing, as you said, of the financial and reframing and borrowing at the zero interest rates or negative interest rates to, you know, and investing in the global market, which can crash, right? So a lot of questions to me when I was reading. But uh, the other one is the proposal of new fiscal rules sir, to find a green new deal, right? So there's a lot of little narratives, but they're all based on the finance money, right? And something that we've been all doing, you know, sustainability, drawing that in. But I think... The solutions came short to me. What do you guys feel about it? Because if, if you have that systemic crash, if we believe that you know there was no continuity in the system, we need something major, right? We had they talked about Keynes coming in and you know saying, oh, we need a stimulus package at the particular time. Somebody else coming in at the later stage saying, you know, maybe we need the austerity argument. It didn't work out as we wanted to, right? It created more harm. So how do you feel about the propositions? Are they enough? Are they not enough? Do we need something more drastic? What are your takes? For me, at least, it was 
there was an interesting bit where there was a, a line at, towards the end of a chapter, I can't remember which it was, one of the later chapters, where it basically said, look, all of this will work. Because for all of this not to work, there'd have to be a global world war or the world economies all at once would have to collapse. Oh. And it be thinking, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> but, but to be fair to them, when they've added on their section on the pandemic, it was a small section at the end. And to be fair, like they were caught on the hop there. Some of their ideas, like you say, they haven't put forward in detail them, but the helicopter money thing, what did the US government do? Started mailing out checks to households. And I mean, who sends a check anymore? But still, like... We got our direct deposit, it's okay. <laughs> yes, same in Canada, right? We are giving money out, right? So, right. so filing money. Yeah. They're actually taking on board those kind of things. And before I Twitter on, I really like the idea of these kind of self sovereign wealth funds in a, in a kind of way. I mean, I'm a proponent with no real knowledge of it, of actually investing in like green new deals, investing in the economy and in infrastructure to drive growth. But when they can, when they talk about sovereign wealth funds, they don't really talk about the nuance. They just oh. list a few countries that have them. And there's a massive difference between Norway's sovereign wealth fund and Saudi okay. Arabia, for example, yes. because one is most certainly not independently controlled from political action. And in Absolutely. fact, props up Saudi Aramco and other organizations that's mainly its political job. Whereas mm -hmm. Norway's one is independently managed, which is kind of mm -hmm. what they're talking about. But they don't also say, but these are also reliant on the fact that they're massive oil producers, which Absolutely. not every country has. So their answer is, let's do it by just borrowing money and get the returns in 15 years time. And this is my final point, this is my final, I'm gonna shut up after this. Mm -hmm. The issue I have is linked to, well, okay, what well, pandemic came along, which is they say this will all be fine. And in 15 years time, we'll reap the rewards of this sovereign wealth fund, et cetera. Yeah. But they also talk about intergenerational balance. Yeah. And what you're actually doing is you're taking the risk that they talk about and putting it 15 years ahead for the next generation. So what yes. happens if it all goes down the, the plug hole at that point? You're just moving the, the risk to another generation. And I don't buy that. So it's, I, I want to jump on because you said sovereign wealth funds, and that was where I, <laughs> national wealth fund. And so then I, I, I had a lot of feelings about this, specifically that they're like, you know, this isn't nationalization. I'm like, this is nationalization. <laughs> Actually, yes. yes. <laughs> um, and, and the challenges, and, I, and, and I'm trying really hard to remember that their lens, right, is Western Europe and the United States. Because the idea that it would be a good idea for any post-colonial country to place their wealth into the hands of external uh, actors to be managed and invested in all of these ways, like, is not only politically unfeasible, I think it's economically stupid, right? Like, there is no way that the institutions are strong enough, and that, quite frankly, that I would trust bankers in the West to protect the interests of developing economies, you know? And so in some ways, I love the idea of a national wealth fund, right? Like I, in some ways I, I really do like that, but it, the, the actual nitty gritty practicality of it is just seems, seems infeasible. Um, the last thing that I will say to, you know, take Greg's model, right, is one of my big objections in is that they, and I've hit on this already, but they define smart policy as making a big difference, simple and explainable and cutting across traditional political lines. That's not smart policy to me, right? I mean, that is a smart policy, right? It would be great if we could do that, but the nuts and bolts and mechanics of policy and governing are not to make a big difference, right? Because it's, that creates uncertainty, which is going to then drive this issue of angrynomics that they have. Incremental institutional change, right, is a much more um, sustainable model and is, is actually what policy looks like in sort of the real world. So it's, it's frustrating to me that, that this, this is their, their metric of success, right, is that you have to be, like, have Nobel Prize winning kind of level of policy change. Um, when, when that's not what it, what it actually looks like on the ground, right? And so it, I think it devalues all of the really good work that professional politicians do 
um, some professional bureaucrats do, right? Um, the other thing of it being simple and explainable, well, yeah, that's great. You should be able to bumper sticker just about everything in life, but sometimes complex economic policy can't be bumper stickers, right? <laughs> Let me jump into that. I think Kate, sorry for, uh, but I think this is this is really exciting because what you're pointing out is policy making is something that we should be slow at. So taking an example of China, what they do is they take small regions, they test the policy in those regions. It works. They expand it. Right. This is, I think, one thing that could have benefited. We want to do a national wealth fund. Great. Place it in a small pocket. Experiment works. Let's expand it, right? For some countries, it may not work, right? As you have position, posited, uh, right? We have developing countries that might not trust the system because, or we can have global financial crisis all over again, wipes out the money, uncertainty, right? The projects, you know, the policy should be scalable in a way that provides some certainty. If, you know, if we're creating the national wealth fund, placing all of our money, what happens if the system crashes? More angry people, more angry economics, another systemic crash, right? So. There is definitely the economics there, Anastasia. Can I throw my head above the parapet? Absolutely. Um, my mouth. So it reminded me of something in the book then when you were talking about the experiments. And I think that's the incremental centrist in me that this is a good idea. But it also reminded me of um, a talk I once went to by Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister who shows up in the book as well. And he was talking a little bit like that was why can't national governments just print their own money or, or issue their bonds, you know, that are at negative mm. interest? Just do it. The governments can do it. It left me talking to a friend afterwards and being like, but okay, but that that implies that the international bond markets will just stay still, that exactly. they will just do what you want them to do. And it, it harks back to the line in there they had about Keynes's breakthrough, which was that supply does not create demand. Yet they hmm. imply that if you issue negative bonds as a government, you supply it, the demand will always be there. Why? Absolutely. Where's your evidence to say that? Where's your evidence that the international bond markets are going to go sod that after a year when things are a bit better in the international thing and naff off somewhere else? So it, I don't exactly. buy the don't buy the experiment in one nation thing. It just doesn't make sense to me. But I interrupted Janina, Janina and she's going to yell at me. No, I'm not. <laughs> I just want to touch on um, two things that I had... Um, about their solutions. So one of their proposed solutions is um, in terms of the data that um, right. massive companies own on us and to pay people for that data. And I just had surveillance capitalism alarm bells going off in my head. And of course they don't even engage with that and they can conveniently excuse it because it's not an academic book. But I think that's a serious concern mm -hmm. that they just completely brush aside. And my second issue is a more global one with the solutions that they propose, because a running theme throughout the book is inequality, and that a lot of this anger is provoked by inequality. And that I agree with. And I think that addressing inequality should be the fundamentals of, of new economic policies. And I just don't see how the policies that they put in place are going to reduce the level of inequality that we have in the US and Europe, which are the places that they're focusing on. Because I can see how, okay, it might bring some people who are at the bottom up, but if you're not simultaneously taxing corporations and the extremely wealthy, then you're still going to have the top expanding and the bottom will never catch up. So I just don't see how their solutions are going to solve what they identify as the central problem. Those are really great points, Janine. I think one is the ethical issue that I've had with the data, right? We have GDPR popping up, we have California, you know, data protection popping out. How do we deal with it? I think left, leaving it blank, it needs some more discussion, as you have said. And yes, money printing, you know, trying to figure it out, who gets more money, right? Where does it trickle down or up, right? If you give the money to the, you know, poor one, they're going to spend it into those corporations, right? If you're not taxing them, the money is not going back. So there's those issues, I think, that we're touching it. But since we're running out of time, let's each of us have one thing that we disliked and loved about the book. I think that would be a really nice end to, to it all. So does anybody want to start? <laughs> I'll start. Um, okay. I, I liked, I, I feel like we, we have been cruel in the last 30 minutes of being <laughs> on these guys because it is really hard to develop a new theory, write a book and put it out into the public sphere, right? You get, you get all the credit for doing, putting yourself out there, right? So that people like us can yell about how you're wrong. Um, I like that they try to tackle this problem um, 
from an economics point of view, right? That they try mm -hmm. to apply these things. I like that they, they intentionally are, are making this um, accessible because I think a lot of people are really turned off. You, you hear economics, I hear economics and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. You know, like, um, and, and I could definitely see somebody like my dad picking this up, right? Who is not, doesn't have any background in this and that it would make him think about things in a, in a slightly different way. I think that's a great thing. I think that is such an asset and that we as, as academia in general should really be thinking about how do we make our work accessible? How do we, how do we write books without, you know, heteroscedasticity in them and you know, all of these other, you know, SAT words, right? So I think I, I salute them for that. One of the, well, I've, I've yelled about shortfalls on this before, but one of the shortfalls that I think that we didn't address fully in this, in this thing and um, that I would like them to talk about is the separation between tribal anger and legitimate anger. And the fact that they seem to think that, that moral outrage can, um, is, is distinguished because that they can, you know, clearly elucidate their issues, right? Tribal anger can clearly elucidate their issues. We just, if you're not part of it, right, you, you don't think that they're legitimate or the issues that they're clearly elucidating are racism, right? And so there is an idea that like, oh, well, that's somehow less, that's not legitimate because they're not, they're not you know, clearly um, talking about what sort of is the basis of their anger. They are, we just don't like it, right? We think that it's not, um, not a good thing. And so it's irrational. But when we think that the, the when, when the anger sort of um, works in our own personal lens of the world, well, then that's rational, right? And I think that is a big challenge and a gap that they need to, to dig into a little bit more, right? And, and talk about how everybody thinks that their issues are based in fact and truth, right? And that their perspectives, nobody's running around being like, I'm just mad because I'm irrational, right? Even two-year-olds have rationality for like why they're throwing a tantrum. So those are my, my closing thoughts. Thank you, Kate. So I'll go next, I'll be quick. Um, my biggest issue in terms of what the book didn't address is what is what the book didn't address. And that is a complete lack of engagement, as I mentioned previously, with anything having to do with the global south and also addressing inequality as if it's purely economic and not talking about race and gender. And intersectionality has been in theory since the 80s, and it's pretty standard now to consider these things together. And I think that that was a, a huge um, missed opportunity. But I, I will join Kate in saying that I think it's great that there are academics who are trying to make complicated concepts accessible to an everyday audience. Because I think very often people feel excluded from the economic system, from the academic world, and that fuels this anger. And this is an attempt to build a bridge. And so I think a lot of the flaws that we've identified are of course coming from our lenses as academics and the kind of rigor that we expect in this kind of work. But I think that had it filled some of those lacks that we identified it, that would make it less accessible to the public that maybe it's trying to reach. Thank you. Thank you, Janina. Greg? So I've gone completely 360 actually since the, <laughs> we started this conversation at the end of it. Actually, I now really like this book because two reasons. One, <laughs> one, is, one in the sense that it's made us go from what we were going to do is a basically a 15 minute kind of book review discussion to almost the better part of an hour discussion because we're all interested and fascinated by it. And for lack of a better word, angry about the book, which is ironic. It also, it made me reach for the bookshelf for books that I haven't touched in several years about the financial crisis, about what happened, got, what went on, because I was so annoyed about some of the gaps that we've talked about. So on that basis, I liked it. Um, it's kind of throwing down a gauntlet for them to come and talk to us, I suppose. But one of the things that I didn't like walking away from the book, and Kate's touched upon it, Janine's touched upon it, it was very much a book that left me feeling at the end, look, people are angry, but people don't really understand why they're angry. We're telling you why you should be angry, and here's the solutions, rather than actually looking at the nuance of it's more than just black and white. And this is 
perhaps a trope that's on the left and the right, which is if only you guys or gals understood why you should be angry, well, then you'd vote for us or you'd support these policies, the economic policies. It, it was very much a looking down from a tower saying, you people, if you just understood why you're angry, you would see that these are the solutions to your anger problems. And I don't think that's right. And I, Kate said it better than I did, but I'm in the UK. I'll just talk about Brexit for less than 10 seconds, which was one of the big problems with the Remain campaign, and I will caveat with I was part of it at the time, is we didn't get at the time that we were saying, look, you'll be worse off. People were already worse off. They didn't care. So <laughs> telling people that this is a bad idea to vote for Brexit, it's the same as the book in some ways. Bad, bad. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. So just to wrap it up, for me, I think it was exciting that the book has opened up, and this echoes Greg and oh, Janina and Kate, it opened up an avenue for me to research. I think it made me think about the issues, it made me explore, and as I said, it's a map, right? You are identifying pieces and bits that you'd like to explore. And one of the deficiencies of the book is exactly in that, in, in its benefit, in a way, because it prompts so many questions. And there's no answers. And I wish there was a second follow-up books for academic. It's like, well, this is an outline. This is why we argued this and this. This is where we came from this and this. I think that was missing. They did provide a really neat outline of the, oh, you should read this and this, like in a further reading. Our further reading is, you know, what do I take from it? What do you tell me to read from it, right? I'm, there's a huge amount of books. How do I navigate? How do I see them the, way, the same way as you do? Because how did you arrive at the, you know, given conclusions? So I think if that was really given to us, the second version. I think our discussion might have been completely different, you guys said. But it's great to, I mean, that we were able to talk about it in such a you know, general way and really turning the book in its way, right? We have this podcast discussion or web webinar discussion, right? Where we are able to discuss it in such a great manner and hear all of your perspectives you know, from different fields. And we agree in so many points, which is ridiculously great. So I think this is a hooray to continuation of the project and we should be back with more books. And next series is gonna be guided by either beautiful Kate, beautiful Junior, or gorgeous Greg. So come and join us for the next one. I'll see you guys later. Okay, so that's a wrap.